Welcome back to topic two, joint arrangements. A joint arrangement is an arrangement where an activity is jointly undertaken and controlled by two or more parties. Huh, that sounds like one of those <laughs> definitions where the explanation is a definition and the definition is the explanation. Uh, my apologies. Uh, think of this joint arrangements as um, another umbrella as far as when companies do business with one another. So at the top of the umbrella, you have joint arrangements uh, where you're really looking at anytime there are two or more parties and they all look like they're doing about equal. Like everybody has about equal um, risks and rewards. Everybody's kind of contributing equally. Like it's really common. We're sharing costs. We're managing risks. We're, you know, providing specialized expertise. Uh, perhaps, you know, one is, um, you know, an expert within the new market and the other one is an expert with this equipment that they're bringing to it. And you're going to have this joint arrangement. So it's, again, continuing on the theme with this chapter, other consolidation reporting issues. This is an umbrella onto its own. So it's not an SPE. It's not a parent and sub. It's not a, uh, a traditional business combination, but rather it's an arrangement with two or more people sharing. And no single party has the ability to control. So whereas uh, control was a prerequisite for the SPEs we just talked about, this one cannot have control. Everything is joint. So from this kind of bigger everything is joint arrangement umbrella, we have two types of joint arrangements. <sighs> I'm not gonna lie to you. These can get pretty muddy in the real world and you know you'll often bring in lots of lawyers and finance people and accountants and you'll you'll you know talk about how we are going to uh, display this on the face of the financial statements as well as like what is the contract going to look like so from this i want you to see that the big umbrella here when there is no control is that you have two main options knowing that in real life it could get a bit muddier one branch from that umbrella is a joint operation. The other is a joint venture. So broadly speaking, a joint operation is when <laughs> two companies just throw assets into the middle and, and use them. And a joint venture is when uh, companies create uh, a new company and jointly contribute to that company. And then they jointly own that new company and they control the initiative through their joint control of that new joint company. So essentially what I like to think here is no new company, new company. Is it always that straightforward and linear? Not quite, but I think it's a really good start when trying to kind of, you know, visualize how are these things different? So in a joint operation, each entity who is jointly contributing to this joint arrangement, which happens to be a joint operation, they retain title to their assets, as well as any obligation for those liabilities involved in this joint operation. Uh, each entity chooses to contribute those assets to this joint operation. Conversely, a joint venture is where the new entity is created and the old entities are still the old entities. They contribute resources to this new joint venture, this new entity, and that entity goes on and does business essentially on behalf of these two or more companies that contributed to this new company. So the creators, the original companies, retain the rights to the net assets of the new entity, but do not own the assets themselves because they contributed those assets to the no new entity. Oh, I know. That's okay. Let's look at how to account for these things. The first one, the joint operations accounting for this is because no legal ownership, no new companies were created. So the assets and liabilities that are used in joint operation are retained on the operators, on the original owners, on the still owners books. Uh, however, it should be noted <laughs> that if these assets that are used in joint operations are also jointly owned, then you would show the portion owned by the operator, by the owner on their financial statements. Okay. 
and then the company that's contributing these assets would then show their share of the expenses and revenues on their financial statements. So essentially, just assume that for now, ignore that one part, uh, assume a company is contributing to joint operations. Their assets are their assets are their assets. So you get to keep your assets on your books, right? You're not moving them anywhere. And then because you essentially have this contract in place that says, hey, I'm going to contribute, you know, my backhoe and my, <laughs> and Bob, you know, <laughs> my backhoe and Bob are going to go out there and help, you know, dig up potatoes on your land, my fellow joint operator. Uh, and then we have agreed that <laughs> it's your land, my backhoe, my labor, and any potatoes that come up, I uh, get sold 50, 50. But of course we have to pay, I don't know, Bob's cousin to go stand at the potato stand and sell the potatoes. So we make a hundred dollars from potatoes. We have to pay Bob's cousin $20. So, uh, and we're joint, we're sharing this, uh, 50, 50. So I get $50 from potato revenues and $10 on <laughs> Bob cousin's labor expense. So I'm going to net uh, 50 minus 10 in expenses or 40 on my uh, statement of earnings. Okay, now let's look at the other arm, I suppose, of our joint arrangements. That is joint venture. So under joint ventures, we are creating a new company and then we are jointly owning that new company. And I kind of like this one. This is intuitive to me because we created a new company. We do not control it because if we controlled it, it wouldn't be a joint venture. So therefore IFRS requires the equity method. Oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Because we have seen this equity method before. That is when we had significant influence. Okay. So this is the thing that is kind of like below control and a, and right in there with significant influence, you know, 50, 50 or 33, 33, 33, um, 0.3, 0.3, 0.3. That is significant influence. So absolutely, intuitively, this falls in line and I am happy with this. So because IFRS 11 requires the equity method to account for JVs, um, if a gain is, uh, occurs from contributing these non-cash assets to the JV, we do need to recognize it in income so long as there is commercial substance. Um, there's a bunch of other rules here. Um, and, you know, for our purposes here, we are looking at this at an awareness level. We want to discuss the theory behind accounting for joint ventures, the theory um, behind the accounting for joint operations, how these uh, joint operations and joint ventures sit under the umbrella of joint arrangements. Uh, a good little mind map may be helpful here to see how it fits in with the whole, you know, multiple entity or multiple operations items. I am not looking for you to revisit uh, the nuts and bolts of equity method accounting, you have done all of that. You have put in the work. Um, so now I just want to bring light to some of these other situations that can come up. Okay, question time. Which of the following does not describe a typical joint venture? Is it A, jointly operated and controlled by two or more entities? B, accounted for using the equity method? C, a new entity is created? Or D, the two entities retain legal title to the assets they contribute. The answer is D. The two entities retain legal title to the assets they contribute. That is not a description of a typical joint venture. In fact, that is the typical characteristic of a joint operation. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's pat ourselves on the back. You are doing fantastic and I will see you in the next video.